moving on, we are going to talk about the uh, the crossroads of military cybersecurity, uh, civilian cybersecurity, and LSU's role in educating the next generation of cybersecurity leadership. Welcoming in uh, Dr. Leslie Blanchard to the show. Uh, Leslie, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, oh, Brian. Sorry, let's pull this around. Sure. Sorry, had to push all the way back. Uh, Leslie, welcome in. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing okay. Tell me all about Bengal Core. Sure. So back in March um, of 2022, President Tate announced this bold and, and really innovative new initiative to integrate the uh, the concept of cybersecurity mm -hmm. with national defense and leadership development. And uh, it was a it was uh, announced at LSU in conjunction with the governor's office, and it was a, a really wonderful kickoff to to launch this this initiative that seamlessly integrates the ability for LSU as a university to become a, an elite choice in, um, in in these three areas, right? And so cybersecurity uh, is a huge area, as, as we were just discussing at the yeah. break, right? It's this, it's this really, really huge area that's growing and exploding. We're not, we as a nation are not producing enough graduates to fill the need because Nobody cybersecurity- Nobody is, I know, yeah. <laughs> It's it's really it's well it's everywhere right we we think we have this this mental image of the hacker in the server room you know tapping into things with the hoodie and things like that. but uh, but it's more than that it's financial systems it's educational systems medical systems every every system uh, that touches technology and touches a computer is vulnerable to cybersecurity breaches how does how did the roads cross between cybersecurity and leadership great question so that was the vision of uh, President Tate uh, when he announced it in that we can create cybersecurity knowledgeable content experts, right? We can we can produce, we've done it for years, we can produce wonderful computer science literate students. But if we really want to set LSU apart as a choice, then we want to create leaders in that field beyond just experts. Okay, uh, so getting away from just your normal, what you'd consider like stereotypical coders or whatnot, uh, you know, maybe a little more introvert with the, with the keyboard in front of their face, this is stepping beyond that to share it with others. Correct. So the Leadership Development Institute, which is my shop here, I don't pretend to know very much about computer science or cybersecurity. I leave that to my friend, Professor Golden Richard, who is uh, really the spearhead guy yeah. for uh, for the cybersecurity initiative. But, um, but the, on the leadership side, we want to make sure that those who we place in these positions uh, have the ability to inspire and motivate others to willingly follow them, right? Uh, without fear of threat or intimidation, or uh, punitive consequences or punishment that they can they can somehow motivate others to come along with them willingly, and that's what we do in our shop. How new is this world of uh, cybersecurity or leadership development? Uh, where <laughs> cybersecurity and where it's headed? I mean, this, we'll get to the leadership aspect on on, mm -hmm. on, on the back end of this because there's mm -hmm. interesting crossovers between the military and civilian level. But the the cybersecurity world, the field itself, where like you just said, we physically can't hire enough people. Uh, it's a world that's ever going to be changing. It's going to be reactive because you don't know where cyber attacks are coming from until they get here. So it, it just as a field itself, it, it, it feels like you've got nothing but a blank canvas in front of you. Yes. Well, again, I, I don't pretend to have expertise in the field of, uh, no, 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 of no. coding and cybersecurity. But what I do know is the workforce. Right. And what we're doing now is creating... Uh, we're creating graduates, hopefully, um, that are preparing for jobs that don't even exist yet because it's such an ever-changing field. I've met with some of the most wonderful students in the world in that cybersecurity department. Mm -hmm. um, they they are friendly and knowledgeable and, and eager, eager to learn, but they also feel that pressure and that what we're preparing for is something that changes daily. Right. It changes daily. And so what do they need in addition to really high quality knowledge of computers and cybersecurity as a science? They also need those transferable skills of flexibility, malleability, continuous learning processes, high quality knowledge um, and, and things like that. All of these things that are transferable to other fields, but they really, really need to focus on those in cybersecurity. How does it affect recruiting students to that? Because you're not able to pitch any, like you said, you we're talking about jobs that don't even exist yet. Yeah. You're pitching an open-ended idea, not necessarily pitching, you know, if you go into accounting, you want to be an accountant. If you go into cybersecurity, you want to be a fill-in-the-blank. 
Right. So if if the world existed where I was in charge of recruiting for this, right, I, I think what I would uh, focus on is, first of all, the, the absolute job security affiliated with having a knowledge and a skill set in cybersecurity. It's yeah. not going away. Right. Yeah. And so so having that job stability and that job security is is important. Um, having the ability to make a very lucrative salary. We have graduates that are leaving at 22 years old with six figure salaries out the gate, plus their That's education insane. being paid for yeah. by a lot of these agents agencies who want to hire the, the the graduates when they do finish and so there's a lot of of um of incentive in terms of the financial aspects of students as well as the financial aspects of graduates um and then third just the the altruistic desire to to want to help your your country to be more safe right and that's where the national defense and the military aspect of it comes in is that we want to um we want to bring folks in who probably have the skills for for Hacking, as you said, sure. but they want to use those skills for good. You know, I've heard, I've worked with law enforcement a little bit, and they've told me a lot of times that the best law enforcement agencies have kind of criminal minds, and it's the same way with well, cybersecurity. If you want to stay a step ahead of the criminal, you gotta kind of have to think like a criminal. Uh, Doctor right. uh, Doctor Leslie Blanchard is our guest. We're talking about the Bengal Corps. Let's talk about that military aspect of this as well, because uh, there's some crossover there that I find to be. I don't know if it's new ground in y'all's world or not, but it's an interesting mix. It's a, there's an interesting Venn diagram here where you're taking what would be military concepts, what would be civilian concepts, and those two worlds are overlapping each other. Uh, what, what's that like bringing two different facets together like that? It has been so rewarding for me personally, and I think uh, very enriching for the students. So in addition to the faculty in the cybersecurity department, uh, which re really teaches that content knowledge. We also have had the opportunity to grow and develop Bengal Corps alongside the uh, the ROTC departments. And so the Air Force ROTC, Lieutenant Colonel Lisa O'Neill, she's unbelievable. Uh -huh. uh, she's, she's at LSU. Uh, Michael Smith, who is the Army ROTC um, commander at LSU. And then uh, Captain Brian Dixon, who is the Navy ROTC commander at Southern University. Not you might not know this, but Southern and LSU combine their ROTC programs and they train together. And so it's co-curricular. So we have students that. from Southern University as well as students from LSU who are in Bengal Corps here with us. Um, and, and I believe it brings a very unique, um, a, a very unique uh, set of, of belief systems and skills because these students have been trained in military discipline. They, they, they really do um, have a great deal of self-awareness and, so, and, and self-growth and, and want to be the best leader that they can, but also the best soldier or the best sailor or the best airman that they possibly can. And so bringing that to the table is really helpful as well. Well, how important is the messaging at that point to let all students know or all potential students know you don't have to be ROTC to get into this, just ROTC is part of it? Right. Okay. So I'm so happy you asked me that question because that's that's really the message that we want to sing far and wide mm -hmm. is that this semester, last semester in the fall and this semester um, in the spring, we have a pilot group of students who intersect at that, that fulcrum of uh, cybersecurity and ROTC here working with us at the Leadership Development Institute on their leadership dispositions. That's where we are now. Mm -hmm. But the goal, if we can find the support and the momentum that we need to find to continue is to offer this opportunity to all students at LSU, regardless of major and regardless of affiliation with ROTC, because these are transferable leadership skills that will help them on the job at all. We're talking with Dr. Leslie Blanchard about the upcoming Bengal Corps, or now in existence Bengal Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie, tell me about the latter model. Oh, I'd gladly tell you about the ladder model. So it's a proprietary program that's exclusive to LSU. We're the only ones who have it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a disposition model of leadership. So that is somewhat differentiates itself from the skills model of leadership, which indicates competency or leadership traits or leadership styles. Uh, dispositions deal with leadership habits, right? And so when you think about a habit, you think about something that you do automatically, sometimes without thinking. It's a second nature type situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of those habits serve you and some of those habits don't serve you and so the first step is to become aware that you have these habits and then if they don't serve you to be able to change them and that's what the ladder model does it uh it it, it sounds a lot more like i don't want to say full-on nick saban ask but <laughs> it, it does sound a lot more trust the process you know the process all the pieces will fall into place uh within there okay so for those who are interested uh what is what are the prerequisites here what are the requirements to be a part of this and we'll get to where it's heading after that. But for those that are thinking about it, 
What do you need to know before getting into Bingo Corps? Okay, so Bingo Corps is right now geared toward underclassmen. So the pilot uh, group of students are either freshmen or sophomores. And so we do that deliberately because we want to catch them at the very beginning of their matriculation through their degree program at LSU and make sure that they're equipped with these dispositions throughout. Um, so as of now, the pilot is closed. I'm sorry, students, you can join us next semester. Uh, but as of now, the pilot is closed. If um, when I'm not going to say if, I'm going to manifest it into when. Uh, we are able to open it up to additional students. They can contact us at the LDI. We will also do a large amount of outreach to the various colleges um, and, and degree programs within LSU, as well as the advisors and the counselors and uh, you, the wonderful people at UCFY, the University Center for the Freshman Year, and enrollment management to make sure that students know upon coming in at orientation that this is an option for them. Level of interest, level of buy-in from students is one side of this, but level of interest and level of uh, curiosity and or appreciation from the outside world is probably going to be the driving factor in the level of success that Bengal Corps is going to have. What sort of feedback have y'all gotten from either the military side or the private business side? Well, we've actually gotten feedback on all three of those of those fronts, as well as additional interest from outside. So I'll mm -hmm. explain that a little bit. Okay. Uh, so the students have given us rave reviews. We have we did a needs assessment at the beginning and, a, and some data collection at the beginning and at the end of Bingo Corps in the fall semester. Mm -hmm. And the students really all showed statistically significant growth in their self-leadership development throughout that process. Um, while the ROTC programs do provide a great deal of leadership development, it's not the same as the latter model. It's so it's a little bit different in terms of the focus and the coaching and being able to identify for yourself where your stressors lie, what your habits are, and how to change them. So we had wonderful feedback from that. And then the uh, commanders that we were talking about, the the, the grown-ups in yeah. the ROTC program, uh, have, have demonstrated to us that they have seen a, 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 just a remarkable change and that the students find it very valuable and very, very helpful. And again, helping them to lead themselves, to lead teams, to lead or organizations, those are great. Probably the most exciting, though, is that outside external employment and the, the idea of, of yeah. putting it in the workforce, right? And so so not only Bengal Corps, but all of the students we've worked with. So Bengal Corps is, a, is our spotlight program that we're here to talk about today. But we have several other student uh, programs, both in high schools and in uh, universities, that we've worked with before. And what, what we know about the workforce is that when we talk to employers and we ask them, tell us about our graduates, they'll tell us that they have excellent content knowledge. They really know their stuff in terms of what they're supposed to know. And they have excellent task skills in terms of what they're supposed to do. Okay. It's those other things that they don't seem to show up with. Uh, some people uh, refer to these things as soft skills, right? But it's things like communication, things like being able to work on a team, building effective relationships, taking instruction well, working... Um, working in tandem with what? others, things like that. The soft things, right? That's not an LSU problem. That's a generational problem. It, 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 well, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it a generational problem uh, as so much as it is a perception problem. So so different generations do view these things differently, right? Right. Um, and, and what we're learning is, especially in terms of leadership, that, well, psychology in general, we learn that, that many of the ways that I'm a, I don't know how old you are, Brian. I'm assuming we're somewhere in the neighborhood of the same age. But um, that that we learned when we were very young, the the suck it up model and the, mm -hmm. and the sink or swim model and, yeah. you know, you, you push through the pain model, um, that those sometimes aren't effective and in many cases can be harmful, right? And so it's a, it's, it's a matter of recognizing that and being able to dial back and approach leadership development in a different way. We're not softening anything. We're not dying things down. We're still creating really resilient, really, really, um, really, really strong people. But at the same time, we're doing it in, in a way that encapsulates mental health, it, enca it encapsulates um, their, protecting their psychology, and making sure that we can prevent the stress and the exhaustion and the burnout that sometimes happens. She is Dr. Leslie Blanchard with uh, LSU. We're talking about that. We've been talking about the Bengal Corps and where it's headed from here. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time. Fascinating stuff. And I'm imagining just the first of many conversations as this thing grows. Leslie, so. appreciate you coming in. Thank you. We are due up for a break. Let's take that break, check traffic, come back. We step outside of East Baton Rouge Parish, check in on the surrounding area with the outside in coming your way next. Okay. Um, to be clear, and we're still, um, we're always on Facebook Live, by the way. So, um, <laughs> When I say it's a generational problem, I, I didn't. I wasn't trying to sound like I was vilifying a young generation. Of course not. Of course not. Of course. Um, no. I, what I mean by that is the gaps in communication between generations. When you have one generation in charge, who doesn't communicate to the next level, who doesn't, but can communicate one level beyond, like Gen X and Gen Z. 
probably get along better than Gen X and millennials. It's not, it's not, right? It's not like the psychology behind that or anything. I just know that as a member of Gen X, when I looked at where it's headed next, then it's just, it's an easier level of communication. Look, I'm so. Gen X to the core. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly what you mean. And we, we were the ones who were, you know, just pushed through it, latchkey it, you know. Latchkey whatever. Kids yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. And so it's, I, I think it, but you're, you're, absolutely spot on bullseye target when it comes to the perceptions, right? And so so we have uh, this, mis this, I guess, misunderstanding a lot of times in leadership positions in organizations that mm -hmm. these kids today just have to change. Well, kids today have never changed. Uh, <laughs> the world changes no, yeah. and we have to kind of go around, you know. Yeah, if anything, what happens. changed. You know, we get hardened, grizzled, whatever with age and mm -hmm. we look at the next, it just, yeah, I, I personally believe millennials have been unfairly vilified they're living in a different world yeah, you're going to blame the generation that was taught wrong right and, and i think and that gen wrong's harsh but you know what i'm saying that's what you mean but i think that gen z is um really going to to benefit from that if they if they accept the gift and i have seen that they have the undergraduate students that i work with and the high school students that i work with amazing at their ability to self-discover, right? So so something that we were never taught in Gen X, right, is how to look at your emotions and manage them and regulate them appropriately. How do we look at our um, our our behaviors and critically analyze them? Some people do it naturally because it's just something that they feel right. is important, but not everyone was, was taught to do that. And so there's sort of some assumptions and some gaps in those assumptions between what the adults who are in charge have never really been taught to do <laughs> and the expectation that the the students or the young people who are coming in to fill into those jobs um they they already know how to do this because they've been taught how to do it in school and they've been taught how to how to really take a critical look at themselves so it's it's a matter of making sure that we're, we're using the right vocabulary we're using the right language that we're communicating with intent and and sharing um sharing the appropriate meaning so it's fun stuff it is it, yeah, yeah it is and now you take all of that, and that's all just the uh, like the the mental and emotional part of it. None of that is the knowledge part of it. None of it. Which that's is, why we exist. Exactly. It's, it. It. I don't know. It. I. From the moment I started reading, and then the 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 rabbit hole that bring you down through the leadership end of it. I just. Can't. I like this crossover. I also like, and we didn't get to this part on the air, but uh, you mentioned President Tate at the very beginning. Yes. A very outside the box idea. So great vision. So. Yeah. Great see this not not only at the intersection of the three right but but to be able to see that it, it's it's special if you can create not just cybersecurity um employees but cybersecurity leaders that's right. that's that's a very very special right you're, you're, you're skipping past just you're skipping you're skipping past the possibility of pigeonholing yourself yeah, exactly so. exactly so that's the, that's the goal hopefully we'll set them apart and i just um I, you know it's I've been an LSU girl my entire life, and so having the opportunity to to kind of you know carry this flag for LSU has been it's been a highlight of my career actually. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming in. I appreciate All right. It. Thanks. So, yes, absolutely. Okay.